Hello everyone, my name is Colby Brown. I'm a Sony artisan and I'm a landscape travel and wildlife photographer. And I'm super excited to be teaching this class, Hometown Adventures from State Parks to National Parks here at the Sony Creative Space today. Now, how this works for those of you that don't fully know is that we have 30 minutes of this recorded video and then we'll have a Q&A session afterwards. So be sure to take some notes and let me know what questions you have and I'll certainly try to address them at the end of, or the last portion of this class. So with that being said, I do have a lot of things to cover. Um, so let's go ahead and jump right in and get into it. Now, I think it's safe to say that 2020 has been a unique year for all of us. Now, I myself, I'm a travel photographer that usually spends six to seven months out of the year traveling around the globe, oftentimes to all seven continents each year. I've been doing this for 13 years. I spent time working for National Geographic. I have multiple, I uh, started multiple of my own companies. Um, and yeah, this one has, has been one for the books. I think in the last 10 to 11 years, I have not been home this much in a given year uh, since that time. It's been truly incredible. Now, this year started off normal for me. I actually spent New Year's Eve celebrating 2020 in Uganda, um, tracking wild silverback gorillas with a couple workshop clients. And it was truly amazing. I mean, we were out there in Western Uganda in the Buwindi Impenetrable Forest. And you know, anytime I get to hang out with these amazing creatures, it is mind blowing. It's just, uh, it, it's one of my favorite wildlife experiences in the world. And regardless, that started off my 21, which I thought was gonna be indicative of how the year was gonna go. Um, plans changed, obviously, uh, but that was a, an interesting start. Now from there, I ended up finding myself in Norway above the Arctic Circle up in the Lofoten Islands, leading a series of photo workshops and working on a couple of video projects. And, you know, anytime I get a chance to spend time up above the Arctic Circle photographing you know, northern lights and, um, you know, out in the wild fjords of, of Norway is an incredible experience and one I hope that everyone watching at some point in your life, you have the opportunity to do so. Um, and so that was a really interesting second trip that I had um, happening in, in February. And then from there, I ended up coming home for a few days and then finding myself down in Cuba, focusing on a couple um, you know, uh, portrait and street photography projects down there and was actually down there in Cuba when the whole lockdown situation happened with COVID, which was interesting. Um, you know, I, I had some clients with me at the time as well, and we kind of had to hurry up and get out of Cuba before we thought U.S. was going to close its borders uh, to Cuba. And so we had to leave a little bit early. And regardless, we got out, everything, everything was copacetic. But since that date, which was, I think, March 11th or 12th, I've essentially been been home. I've been been here in the U.S. Um, for the last what six months now, uh, six seven months. And so, just like you guys, I too have been struggling with you know trying to stay creative and um, having the inspiration to get out and shoot. And I think it's safe to say that a lot of us here in the U.S. sometimes neglect the beauty that we have around us, from a local level to a state level, and certainly to some of the national parks. Which is why I was so excited to put together this class so that you know we we all can go through this this experience together and, and find new and amazing places to explore in our own backyard in our own region of the u.s and um, even just nationally here um, in the u.s and some of the beautiful wild natural places that we have so how is this class going to break down i essentially get broken down into two different segments now the first segment is going to focus our attention on research and planning so this is just the idea that you you want to get out and do something, you want to get out and shoot, but you don't know where to shoot, you don't know what opportunities you have, you don't know what's in your own backyard, let alone what's in your state, um, you don't know what restrictions are happening in national parks. So this is kind of where we're, I'm going to give you some of my favorite resources that are both mobile apps as well as online resources to help you plan some of these adventures, these homegrown adventures for you. And then the second section is that we're going to talk about gear. We're going to talk about my favorite cameras to use, cameras and lenses to use for landscape situations, for wildlife situations, and then for night and astro as well. And I'll talk about why I use certain cameras and why they're my favorite and certain lenses. And then if you guys have questions about gear, again, hold those questions until the very end, uh, and we'll jump on and do that live session. I'll happily answer all of your gear questions, all of your planning session. Uh, but regardless, that's how this class is going to break down. So let's go ahead and, and, and move forward. Now to start off the research and planning section, I want to talk about, you know, three or four of my favorite online resources when it comes to planning adventures. Now, most of the time I'm planning bigger expeditions, you know, trying to, you know, track down 
uh, you know, snow monkeys in Japan or, or, or tracking jaguars in, in uh, Brazil or going to unexplored regions of Patagonia. But here in the U.S., we fortunately have a bit more infrastructure and a bit more resources when it comes to giving you information to make sure that you can plan your adventures, you know, safely um, and, and timely and to do them, you know, certainly with the right gear as well. So these are some of my favorite resources uh, that I use on a constant basis. And I have been using uh, this year, which has been really excellent when it comes to um, making sure that I'm prepared for a lot of these adventures that sometimes I've gone on myself with and sometimes I've brought my family, uh, my nine-year-old son and my wife with. So uh, lots of opportunities out there. Now, our first one is essentially the idea or the notion that no matter where you live in the United States, that you will have a state park website that you can reference for. Now, I live in the state of Pennsylvania. I moved here a couple years ago from Colorado. And one of the first things that I did was check out the uh, Pennsylvania State Park website. There's a lot of places around me and probably around you that you didn't realize was a state park. And so this is a great resource to figure out not only what opportunities you have around you, um, what are restrictions, what roads are closed, how do you need to pay attention to obviously COVID details, um, you know, what are camping situ situations like? How do you reserve permits? It will also give you contact information, which is very handy depending on what you're looking for. Uh, for example, for me in Fall Colors, there's a couple state parks I love to explore around here in Eastern Pennsylvania, and I have all their contact information here on this website. So I can reach out and give a call or shoot an email and say, hey, how are Fall Colors looking? Or hey, are these particular roads closed? And they'll give me that information right away. So regardless of where you're at, be sure to check out your local state parks because those are the lesser known parks um, in your own state and you might be surprised at what you can find. Now, of course, um, our national park system is pretty robust and pretty amazing here in the United States. And so I'd also make sure you check out any national park that you're thinking of exploring to. Um, the summer, uh, things were, even with COVID, it was a little bit too busy for me to feel safe to go there. But now that things are dying down, it's past fall, we're going into to winter now. The national parks are still a viable option for a lot of safe exploring out in nature and away from crowds. And so making sure you check out the national park websites for any of the parks that you're interested in. Again, great information on road closures, on COVID restrictions. This is a screenshot for Yosemite National Park that I took just yesterday, um, which is about two or three weeks before you guys are watching right now. But regardless, you can see down here at the bottom of this screenshot, there's alerts in effect for Tioga Road, um, uh, you know, w uh, Wawona Road, all sorts of stuff out there that you should know before you visit these different locations. Again, this will give you plenty of information on accommodations, on logistical planning, contact information, camping information, all sorts of fun stuff. A lot of people don't realize or don't at least reference the National Park website. So do be sure to check those out if you're thinking about exploring in a national park. Now, now that those two big ones are out of the way, the state parks and national parks, let's look at a little bit more of local information. So... Oftentimes we're, you know, some people of course want to go travel to Yosemite or Glacier National Park or check out some of their bigger national parks in their state, but that leaves a lot of opportunities for different outdoor adventures that are probably in your own backyard. Now, as I mentioned before, I lived here in Eastern, or moved here to Eastern Pennsylvania just three or so years ago, and I didn't know a lot about this area. I'd spent some time here when I was a kid, but I don't really remember too much about it. And so one of the first places that I went to is a resource that I love, which is called All Trails. Now, All Trails has a mobile app on Android and iOS, and it also is a website where you can have a free account. There's also a pro account that offers a couple different things. But regardless, even with the free account, I can sit there and put in my information about where I live, and it's gonna pull up tons of information when it comes to you know, ratings and trails, uh, you know, biking trails, camping information, fishing, um, what are dog friendly parks, all sorts of stuff. Um, and as you can see here from the screenshots that I'm, I'm showing you right now, uh, it also has, like I said, rating systems so that you'll have other outdoor enthusiasts and regular people giving ratings based on their experiences in these locations. So if you, you know, want to go on a mountain biking trip with your camera and you want to know what type of, of gravel or road conditions are happening on a certain bike you, or a certain trail, you can look that up here. If you are looking for things that are, again, dog friendly, um, you can do that if you want to bring your animals with you. 
There's tons of information here. And this is kind of where I really like to think of this more as a, a micro level um, aspect of research compared to more of the macro, which is like the bigger state park websites, national parks. Uh, online services and mobile apps like AllTrails are just phenomenal to find those local hidden gems that you might not know have ever existed. Maybe you've driven by them many times and seen signs, but you don't really know about them. So here you can find distance information, again, reviews and information about you know uh, how long it takes, the duration, um, how far you'd have to go, and all sorts of other information. And then you can sort those based on activities that you're interested in, whether it's bird watching or camping, off-road, off-road driving, uh, you know, bike, uh, road biking, I mean, all sorts of stuff, anything you can think of when it comes to outdoor activities, all trails is one of the best resources for local information for things that you can probably go check out a good, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes from your house that you never knew existed. Now, the next thing that I like to talk about or the next resource I want to focus on is Google Earth. Now, a lot of people think Google Earth is just this fun, you know, uh, experience that you can have online where you can kind of, you have a bird's eye view of the entire world based on this crazy satellite information. And that's true. But in reality, once you dive down into the details and realize what it offer you, it also is a great place in order to check out locations um, and, and angles even because of, of how the artificial intelligence has taken this crazy amount of detail from satellite maps and then extrapolated that and try to give realistic impressions of how mountains look and how things line up. So for example, if I went, you know, when I first moved here, I wanted to check out some state parks. And so this is Promised Land State Park, which is just, you know, 25, 30 minutes north of where I live here in Eastern Pennsylvania. And before I even went there for the first time, I jumped on Google Earth. I was able to kind of zoom in and see a lot of detail. Um, this is not fully zoomed in the screenshot that I'm showing you right now, but regardless, you know, I was able to zoom in even further and see where all the beaches were, to see where the roads were, to get all sorts of, of interesting information that I think is relevant to um, someone exploring, especially an area that they've never explored before. Now, in addition to that, it's also pretty amazing to use, especially if you're into drone photography or aerial photography of any kind, is that you can use Google Earth to kind of look from a bird's eye perspective looking down and see patterns in the earth or patterns in rivers and streams. And then assuming it's safe and you're allowed to fly in those areas, you can then take your drone out and go find these unknown or undiscovered areas. Um, this is a screenshot of, of a place in Utah, but I know a handful of aerial photographers or at least aerial enthusiasts that are mostly photographers that will use Google Earth to specifically search out these types of locations that you have really cool you know, gradations of color or textures in, in um, textures on the ground and you know geological formations that they couldn't see when you're standing on ground level. But when you're looking at it from a Google Earth standpoint, it's a great resource to be able to find some of these cool, cool destinations. Now, the last one that I want to talk about is Instagram. Now, Instagram is an app that I think a lot of us are, you know, probably using already. Obviously, I'm sure everyone here has already heard of it. Uh, it's a great tool for inspiration. It's a great tool to share in, you know, images and to hopefully build a bit more of an audience. But it can also be a really great tool when it comes to not only finding new locations, but also getting real-time information about what those what the conditions are at these places. Now, for me, oftentimes when I figure out I want to go shoot a certain location, is that I'll use Instagram and I'll do a GPS search within there. Um, within the application and try to figure out what has already been shot there. So that in and of itself gives me a little bit of an indicator of what images have already been taken, what angles are possible. It gives me a bit of inspiration and an idea before I get to a location. Some photographers like to start fresh, other photographers like to be a bit more prepared, but regardless, it can be a good exercise or at least one that's good for me. Now here you can see in the screenshots that you're seeing right now is um, a, a series of screenshots. The left is kind of my homepage for, for my profile there on Instagram. And then the middle is two searches that I've done. Now the first one in the, right in the middle is Ricketts Glen State Park. Now this is one of my favorite locations to go to during fall colors. This is where I will go and, and explore. It's a, it's a pretty amazing, it's, it's a kind of half crescent or a Y-shaped trail that has like 22 different incredible waterfalls and tons of streams that are really just amazing to photograph during fall colors. Now fall in a given season depend is dependent on, you know, water levels in the spring and summer and how cold things get and all sorts of other stuff. People can estimate when you're going to get peak time, but you never really, really know. And so 
for me, I'll often use, you know, a search for Ricus Glen State Park and that middle screenshot you see is the top searches. So these are the ones that are the, the top images that have been shared there. These aren't things that are super relevant for what's happening in real time, but they're just the stuff that are probably some of the more popular images. So if we just kind of sidestep that for this particular example and then move to the screenshot on the right, that's where you click on that recent tab just on the right side underneath the map. And there you're gonna get the most recent images that have been shared at the given location that you're searching for. So to me, this is really great because if I want to make sure I'm getting peak color at a location, then I will then search for this for that location, look at the recents tab, and then oftentimes I will see multiple images taken that day that I'm searching for that location, and then I can sit there and see for myself. Okay, you know, is this image, um, you know, what what does everything look like? Now, normally, you know, people can certainly post images at different times than that actual day. But it, usually there's four or five or six or seven, depending on the location. If it's a super busy or popular location, you'll get hundreds of images. But regardless, this will allow me to look at a handful of different images and say, okay, the color looks great right now or it's too early. And I even used that this year when I was searching for Ricketts Glen because I did go up and photograph there and ended up using Instagram because I was told that it was at peak color, but I wasn't 100% sure. So I went on Instagram and it turned out that it was still about a week early from what information I had been told online. And so I used that information of the most recent images that I saw, planned my, planned my trip accordingly, went the following week, had the most amazing color that I've been out seen out there in years that uh, I wouldn't have had that opportunity to have if I had gone a week earlier. So either way, Instagram is a phenomenal tool to help you find inspiration, to share your images and certainly to get real time updates on what conditions are like for a variety of different places, certainly around the world, but definitely in the context of this class at your local um, your local places. Now, again, this will be more helpful at destinations that do have a decent amount of travelers to. It's not going to get your you know tiny hidden trail behind your house or you know on the other side of town, but you might be surprised at the information you will find. And either way, it's worth a search regardless. So now once you've gone and used all trails or your state park website or national park website um, or checked out Google Earth and you found a location that you want to shoot, now it comes down to the, the planning side of things from a photographic perspective. So, um, you know, there's a handful of different opportunities or different apps out there that can help you because typically this is stuff to use when you're out there in the field. One of my favorites is one called PhotoPills. Now, as you can see here from the screenshots you're seeing right here, PhotoPills is essentially a one-stop shop for almost everything that you could possibly need in order to plan a specific kind of shoot. You it will give you trajectories of the moon and the sun and angles of, of light. You'll also get things like hyperfocal tables and depth of field tables, um, you know, uh, pretty much anything you can think of for kind of the outdoor photographer, not even just landscape, but just outdoor. And the greatest example that I can show you is what you're seeing right here. So in the middle screenshot on this page, you can see that I have made a screenshot from the PhotoPills app looking at the Statue of Liberty. Now let's say that I wanted to photograph the Statue of Liberty, so I made a pinpoint on that, and right there I can see the trajectory and the angles of the sun, where it's going to set and what's happening. But if I pull out from that map, then I can see where those angles are gonna coincide with other locations. So for example, if I wanted to photograph the moon, the full moon setting behind the Statue of Liberty, I can use this application to figure out exactly where I would need to be on which date I need to be and exactly what time so that you can plan all of those pieces out together. And then in real time, you can use this app once you get there in location to kind of put up a live view and you kind of hold up your phone and then it's gonna kind of show you and triangulate exactly where in real time through the phone using kind of augmented reality where the sun's gonna set or where the moon's gonna set for that particular situation. So it's really a phenomenal tool that is should be in each one of your your toolboxes. Now, it's not a free app, it's about 10 bucks, but I think it's highly worth it. And again, it's available on both Android and on Apple. So now that the research and planning side of things is kind of out of the way, let's go ahead and talk about some of my favorite gear and why. Now, when it comes to a landscape photography kit or my landscape photography kit, there's a handful of things that will typically be there every single time. Now, first and foremost is gonna be my Sony A7R Mark IV. Now, this is a 62 megapixel beast of a camera. Uh, it has great dynamic range, so you get great details in the shadows and in the highlights. 
It uh, you know has a slightly bigger grip than previous generations for those that have large hands like myself. Um, you're also going to get great autofocus capabilities, which we'll talk a little bit about in the wildlife section. But it really is my go-to camera um, for anything out there in in the wild, specifically when it comes to landscape stuff. It it can take a beating. It can you know it can get get wet. I've had them under waterfalls. I've had them in freezing temperatures. I've had them in deserts. Um, it is my favorite camera currently and definitely the number one camera that I use when it comes to landscape photography. Now, next up, um, or I guess before I should say next up, my go-to for landscape when it comes, or landscape images when it comes to lenses is has to do with kind of the holy trinity. Now, these are this is the series of lenses that are um, part of really any man camera manufacturer's lens lineup, but to me, they are a staple when it comes to landscape work, and I will oftentimes have all three of these lenses in my bag no matter what for any landscape situation that I'm shooting. So for me, that's going to start with the Sony 16-35 f2.8 G Master lens. It's incredibly sharp corner-to-corner. Uh, -corner. It's a great, great lens. Handles flare really, really well. Um, it, it, it's really great to really get up and close to some foreground elements and really still capture a ton of the scene that you're in. Now, if you don't need the f2.8 version, which you don't necessarily need for um, regular photography work, whether you're not doing astro or night, which we'll talk about later, um, you can go for the 16-35 f4 version, um, which is going to save you a bit of money and it's certainly a bit smaller and a bit lighter. So it's another good option. It's not as sharp in the corners, but it's still a pretty dang good lens. And in the center, it is still is, is, is a great lens. Now, next up, we have the Sony 24-70 f2.8 G Master lens. Again, you don't need the G Master. You can opt for something like the 24 to 105 f4, which is a great lens. It's super small, uh, or at least small in comparison to the 24 to 70. It's tack sharp as well. Uh, but coming back to the 24 to 70, it is a great kind of all-purpose lens. It's in most camera, you know, camera bags out there, gear bags for people doing outdoor or travel photography. Um, this particular lens is one of my favorites. It's what I use when I shoot a lot of panoramas because I find 16 to 35 is way too wide. So the 24 to 70 kind of fills that middle gap and is kind of the, the jack of all trades, so to speak. And then to round out our holy trinity, we have the Sony 70 to 200 f2.8 G Master lens. Um, it's tack sharp. It's a great lens. I use it also can double as a portrait lens if you're doing some of that type of stuff as well as doing outdoor work. It is one that I find that I use in most of my situations. So if you want to have something that kind of fills that gap for you, um, then I highly recommend you, you, you get a telephoto lens to use for your landscape kits. It's really great to isolate and, um, you know, find intimate moments within nature. And again, this is another one that you could substitute maybe a 70 to 200 f4, which is also a great lens and one that I have used extensively when I need to go with something that's a bit lighter and I don't really need the 2.8 version. I will say that if you are shooting portraits for whatever reason, the 2.8 version does make a difference of shooting at 2.8 around the you know, 100 to 200 millimeter range. You still can get some really nice background bokeh and blur rather than if you're shooting at f4 on the uh, slightly less expensive f4 version. Now let's go ahead and talk about astro and night photography. This is going to be a little bit different than my standard landscape kit because this is more about having faster glass. You want glass that has the ability to use a lower aperture number, a lower f-stop, so that your, your, your aperture gets wider so that you get more light into the uh, hitting your sensor, which is what you need during night and astrophotography. Uh, you want to try to get as much light to hit your sensor as possible so that you don't have to use a higher ISO than necessary. So to start things off, my go-to when it comes to night and astro is a bit of a mixed bag. Now I use, I still have the Sony A7R Mark IV. That's still again my go-to. It's probably what I use the most because I just love that resolution at 62 megapixels. It handles ISO pretty dang well, especially for a 62 megapixel camera. Great dynamic range, and it's really nice to be able to blow these prints up quite big. I also have started using a bit of the A7S Mark III. Uh, this is a newer camera that's just been released. Um, it's 12 megapixels for stills, but because it does so well at ISO, it is kind of like the, it's almost like seeing in the dark just how amazing it is. It's like a, a night vision camera, so to speak. So if I'm doing any video work at night, A7S III is certainly my kit. Um, and I still will, you know, make prints taken out of the 12 megapixel camera and I've blown them up big, like it can still handle it if you know what you're doing in terms of upsizing or up your images. Um, but those are my two go-to cameras when it comes to night and astro work. Now, when it comes to the actual lenses, those are a bit of a mix with new stuff and, and old stuff. 
So my number one go-to right now is the new re released Sony 12 to 24 f 2.8 G Master lens. It's a big lens, it's a bit heavy, but shooting at 12 millimeters and getting just so much of the night sky is truly an incredible experience. And it's a pretty amazing, amazing lens because it can shoot so wide and because it's so fast. Now, if you don't have that lens and you already have the 16 to 35 f 2.8 that I talked about before, then you can certainly use that. I have used that for a lot of my images. It's still great. Um, it's just that 16 is not 12, obviously. So you can still get a lot of night sky, but not as much as I can when I'm shooting 12. And the difference for that is really if like for me, if I'm going for the Northern Lights or if I'm trying to capture the Milky Way and I really wanna get all of the galactic core and just kind of maybe a mountain in the bottom portion of the image and tons of stuff up in the sky, having a really wide, fast lens really can make a difference. Now you can of course use F4 versions of these lenses, but just realize that you're losing a stop or more of light when you do that. And so that you're gonna to have to increase your ISO. So I'm trying to minimize that increase of ISO. So I wanna use the fastest lenses possible for any of this night stuff. Now, in addition, we, you know, Sony has two new uh, additions as of this year and last to their prime lens lineup. So you have the Sony 18 F1.8 G Master lens or not uh, G lens. And then you also have the Sony 24 millimeter F1.4 G master lens. Now, both of these prime lenses are pretty phenomenal lenses. They're small, they're lightweight, um, they're incredibly tack sharp, and they're great to use. The limitation of course, is that they are prime lenses so that you can't zoom in or out if you need to, depending on the subject that you're photographing. But regardless, they're great lenses. They're pretty affordable. They're super light and portable. Um, and they offer great results when it comes to shooting night or astrophotography. Now for my last kit, let's go ahead and talk about wildlife photography, which is a completely different beast than a lot of the landscape stuff that's out there. So we're gonna use different lenses, different cameras, and let's talk a bit about that. So first and foremost, my main go-to camera for most of my wildlife stuff is the Sony A9 Mark II. I've also used the first generation A9. It just essentially has the best autofocus system in the entire industry of any camera manufacturer in my mind. Um, its capabilities to track moving subjects in low contrast situations is, is unparalleled, to be honest. Um, I've used it all over the world to photograph, you know, jaguars and, uh, you know, small birds and, and you know, caiman uh, or, or kind of, you know, crocodile or alligator like, like creatures in, in um, Brazil and South America. Um, you know, llama, pretty much anything you can think of I, uh, in terms of wildlife, I've used my A9 II, and I've gotten great results. It's a 24 megapixel camera, uh, handles ISO very well, so when you need to pump that ISO to shoot at a faster shutter speed, you're still gonna get great stuff. I, I've literally photographed um, uh, wild jaguars in Brazil at the end of the day, well past sunset, where it's almost pitch black, shooting at, you know, 12 to, you know, 10,000 or higher ISO and had great results. Um, where I, I still need to you know, do a little bit of noise management and, and uh, mitigation with with dealing with noise, but um, you know once I've processed that image, the results are just phenomenal. Um, and then I also still, when it comes to wildlife, I will use my Sony A7R Mark IV. It's a 62 megapixel uh, camera, as we talked about before. Great dynamic range, and the autofocus system is quite significantly improved over the Mark III version which means that it can be a viable substitute as a secondary or even sometimes a primary camera when it comes to wildlife photography. Now, next up in terms of lenses, I use a mixture of lenses. One of my favorite uh, newer lenses to my lineup as of last year is the Sony 200 to 600 F 5.6 to 6.3 variable G Master lens. Um, it's essentially one of my favorites because of that 200 to 600 range and the fact that it's, uh, you know, movement ring in terms of jumping between 200 to 600 is so much shorter than most telephoto lenses. Most lenses that have this much range, you have to keep turning and turning in order to go from 200 to 600. This one is very, very small. It's like two inches or something like that. So if I need to go from 200 to 600 really quickly, I can with this lens. Um, it's a bit tall. It's not the most portable lens. Um, it's also not the most fastest at a 5.6 to 6.3, so maybe not great for everyone around the beginning or tail ends of the day. But if you have a little bit of light, this lens is phenomenal and it's great, especially when you partner it with the A9 Mark II. Um, I, I just, I, I love this lens. I love the images that come out of it. Um, I love everything about it. So it's one of my favorite wildlife lenses. 
Next, we also have the Sony 100 to 400. Now this is the um, F 4.5 to 5.6 G Master lens. And this one is again, one of my favorites. You don't have the same reach. Um, obviously it's 400, not 600 as the previous lens we talked about, but it's incredibly sharp. I'd say it's even, it's sharper than the 200 to 600. Um, and it's a great lens that I've used in a lot of trips around the world. It is a bit smaller and more compact compared to the 200 to 600. Um, and it's very capable. It's a little bit faster, as you can see with that variable aperture of 4.5 to 5.6. So again, maybe not necessarily the greatest when you have an, you know almost no light out there uh, and you have to use a faster shutter speed to photograph something. But again, if you have a little bit of light or especially if you have great light, is a favorite lens. I usually have one of my A92s. I have a couple of them with a 100 to 400 um, when I go on safari in Africa or things like that. And then I'll have another camera with other bodies, but it's always usually one of the ones that I always have with me just in case, depending on, you know, different animals that I'm tend to be uh, photographing or tracking at the time. And then of course, we also have the Sony 400 F 2.8 G master lens. Now this lens is a bit more of a fantasy lens for most people. I say that because it's a $12,000 lens. It's very expensive, but it is an amazing lens. It is one of my favorite when it comes to wildlife because it's a 2.8 lens. So it's very fast. As long as you can fill your frame at 400, it's great. Um, it's just, if, if you don't have the ability to purchase it, I highly recommend if you're photographing something like bald eagles or something like that, that requires that faster lens, think about renting this lens. Um, you'd be surprised at just how amazing it is. It is heavy. It is still, um, you know, over five and a half pounds, but it's much lighter than a lot of the other previous 400 2.8s from uh, Canon and Nikon out there. Um, previous generations of them at least. And so a lot of the, the lens was designed and built for mirrorless cameras. So a lot of the, the weight of it is actually set back towards the camera itself. So you don't get that kind of top heavy where it kind of drops down a little bit as you're holding it. So you can, in theory, if you have, if you're strong enough, you can hand hold this. I've done it many times. Most people will have these lenses on a gimbal head or a tripod. Um, but if you need to, you can hand hold this, um, assuming you can well, hold up the lens to begin with. Now, in addition to all these lenses, any wildlife photographer will probably have a couple teleconverters as well. Sony has some great versions of the 1.4 and the two times teleconverter. I've used um, both of those on all three of these lenses with both the A9 Mark II and the A7R Mark IV with great results. Anytime you are magnifying, you will lose a little touch of quality, but usually again, you can kind of pull that back out in post-processing. Um, and it's pretty amazing that the results that you can get even hand holding some of this stuff with some of these lenses and being able to zoom in and get, you know, use the four, Sony 400 F2.8 with a two times teleconverter, which gives you an 800 millimeter reach at 5.6, which is phenomenal. Um, so either way, that's kind of my go-to wildlife setup, A9 Mark II or A7R Mark IV, 200 to 600, 100 to 400, and the 400 F2.8 if needed, uh, mixed in with the 1.4 teleconverter and the two times teleconverter. Both of, you know, all that whole setup will go with me on most of my wildlife shoots, um, both here in the States, locally when I'm photographing black bears here in Eastern Pennsylvania, or if I was gonna go photograph, you know, grizzlies or Alaska coastal brown bears in Alaska to doing something more exotic in places like Namibia uh, or South Africa. So that's the end of this recorded session of this class. We're gonna do our Q and A session in just a second. If you guys want to check out more of my work, be sure to check out www.coolybrownphotography.com. I'm also on Instagram at Colby Brown Photography, as well as on Twitter and Facebook. You're also more than welcome to check out on my website. I have tons of workshops coming up in 2021 and 2022 of places all over the world once we can be traveling again. And I'll probably have some more local and national focused events as well. You can sign up to the newsletter and be updated on all that information. But regardless of all that, let's go ahead and end this recording, jump into our live Q&A. Hopefully you have a bunch of questions ready for me. I'm happy to answer them. Thanks again for watching and let's go ahead and jump over there.